Today, as we continue looking at understanding poetry, we're gonna move into the forms of poetry. Now, there are many forms of poetry. I've included six here. Let's take a look at the couplet, the acrostic, the haiku, the concrete poem, free verse, and the limerick. But before we do that, we'll have to look and see how can we tell the differences between all of these six types of poems? Well, it depends on how their lines and their stanzas are written. Well, most poems are written in lines. If you take a look at the right-hand example where we have the poem March by Eleanor Farjan, you can see with the red arrow, a line is one set of, of words put together, a blue day. That is just one line. Now, a group of lines in a poem is called a stanza. If you see lines four, five, and six put together, one crow, melting snow, springs winning. That is considered a stanza, one entire subject or topic being explained through several lines. Now, stanzas will separate ideas in a poem. They kind of act like paragraphs. For example, this particular poem has two stanzas, the first stanza being a blue day, a blue jay, and a good beginning. The second stanza, once again, is one crow, melting snow, springs winning. So now that we know what lines and stanzas are, let's look at our different types of poetry. Let's start with a simple one, the couplet. A couplet is a poem, or at least a part of a poem, where you look at a stanza written with two rhyming lines. Now, AABB -B is the rhyme scheme that you usually see throughout. So let's take a look at The Tiger by William Blake. We'll take one stanza at a time to show where the couplets are. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Well, a couplet is supposed to have a rhyme scheme, an AA or a BB rhyme scheme. You're looking for two rhyming lines. Well, we have that in lines one and two. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. So we have one idea. We've got the rhyme. We have two rhyming lines together. That would be considered a couplet. As we continue on, in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Again, every two lines that we have, the ends of the lines rhyme. As we put those together as one idea, you have a couplet. So our third couplet would be, in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire or thine eyes? Skies and eyes rhyme. The two lines create an entire uh, idea, therefore we have a couplet. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? We have two rhyming lines. We have one idea. The BB rhyme scheme is there. It is a couplet. Let's go ahead and finish our poem of the tiger by William Blake. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? What the furnace was thy brain? What the anvil? What dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. Did he see his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So again, couplets, when you look at the A-A-B-B -B rhyme scheme throughout, every rhyming pattern, the A-A or the B-B, creates a couplet. There's one idea being expressed in two rhyming lines. The next we're going to look at for forms of poetry is going to be the Diamante. A Diamante is a seven-lined poem written in the shape of a diamond. It doesn't rhyme, even if there is some magical reason that all of a sudden rhyming words do show up, it is not required to rhyme. It does, however, follow the pattern. You can see there's a pattern over on the right-hand side, and you can use synonyms or antonyms because you're doing a lot of listing. So take a look at the Diamante pattern. Your line one should have your topic, and it should be a noun. Line two is going to give two adjectives that relate to the noun in line one. 
Line three should have three ing words. Almost always these are going to be some sort of action verbs, but they end in ing. Line four are four nouns or short phrases that link your line one's topic. Line five is going to repeat kind of the line three idea, but they're going to be different words. So just, had you had, just as you've had three ing words in line three, you have three ing words in line five. In line six, you're going to have two adjectives, just like you did in line two. And then in line seven, you're going to have your ending topic noun, just like you did in line one. So line one matches line seven, line two matches line six, line three matches line five, and line four is going to be the longest piece. All of it is on one topic. So let's take a look at the synonym diamante. And again, we put over on the right hand side the pattern that you would see in diamante. So for your topic for noun, we have monsters, and two adjectives that might describe monsters would be creepy and sinister. We have three ing words that would describe monsters. What are they doing? Hiding, lurking, stalking. Now we're looking for four nouns or short phrases that would again kind of link to the topic of monsters. Well, in line four we have vampires, mummies, werewolves, and more. Now we go back again to that three ing words. Again, it has to relate to the monsters in line one, maybe have some action verbs. So here we have chasing, pouncing, eating. We're looking for two more adjectives for line six for monsters, and so monsters can be hungry or scary. And then you have your ending topic. What are monsters? What's another noun for a monster? How about creatures? Notice the shape of the Diamante poem. It looks like a diamond. We have another example, an antonym Diamante here. The way that these usually are read, you just read from line to line. Again, you're not looking for a specific rhythm pattern. You're not looking for rhymes. It's just following the pattern of the nouns, the adjectives, the verbs, the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, and then the last noun. And this is an antonym because we're going to go from day to night. Day. Bright, sunny, laughing, playing, doing. Up in the east. And then the night side of the poem. Down in the west. Talking, resting, sleeping. Quiet, dark, night. Our next format for a poem is the haiku. A haiku is a Japanese poem with three lines of five, seven, and then five syllables. There should be a total of seven, 17 syllables in the entire poem. These do not rhyme. Again, if it magically appears, that's fine, but you should not be rhyming in a haiku. Almost always a haiku is about an aspect of nature. A lot of times people will use time and the seasons as a part of that nature. It is supposed to capture just a moment in a time, just a moment in time, just one glimpse at nature, one glimpse at a season. Little frog among rain shaken leaves, are you too splashed with fresh green paint? By Gaki. So it captures a moment in time where we just have noticed a frog sitting on a leaf. We definitely have that done. Is it about an aspect of nature? Well, yes, we're looking at rain shaken leaves and we have a little frog on them. But what we mostly look for in a haiku is, do they have their three lines? Is there five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line, and five syllables in the third line? Well, when we count out the syllable sounds, little frog among, line one has five syllables. Rain shaken leaves are you too, has seven syllables in the second line. The third line has five syllables splashed with fresh green paint. The next format of a poem is the acrostic. In an acrostic poem, the first letter of each line read down the page spells the subject of the poem. This is a type of free verse poem. We don't really look for rhythm or rhyme in it. It does not usually rhyme. People have a tendency to try and rhyme them. It does not need the rhythm or rhyme counted out. The most important part is the topic is being spelled down the first letter of each line in the poem and that it is describing the topic throughout the lines. Let's look at Paul Poli's uh, leaf. 
loose brown parachute, escaping and floating on puffs of air. As you can see on the left-hand side, the very first letter of each line spells out leaf, and the idea, the topic of leaf, is in the poem. The next format of a poem that we'll discuss is the limerick. A limerick is a funny poem of five lines. Now, one, two, and five, they all rhyme. Lines three and four are shorter, and they rhyme. So we have this A, A, B, B, A pattern for rhyming, and lines three and four have a tendency with the rhythm to be shorter lines. Line five has a tendency to refer to line one because you want this sense of closure, this sense of circular uh, going back to line one. And limericks usually are a kind of nonsense poem. There should be some sort of wit, some sort of humor, maybe even something of a nonsensical nature. Let's check out John Chiardi's There Seems to Be a Problem. I really don't know about Jim. When he comes to our farm for a swim, fish as a rule jump out of the pool. Is there something the matter with him? So we have our five lines. It does seem kind of funny. We are kind of poking fun at Jim. Apparently when he goes swimming, uh, the fish are jumping out of the pool. I have a feeling they don't actually do that in reality, but maybe, maybe there could be a sense of that's what they're doing is staying away from him. And so there's this sense of humor or wit. How are the rhymings going? Well, we can see at the ends of lines one, two, and five, we have the words Jim, swim, and him. They all rhyme. Lines three and four, how's their rhymes? Well, we have rule and pool at the ends of their lines, and they are shorter when fish as a rule jump out of the pool. It gives the five line poem a sense that there might almost be four lines, and it gives people that more sense of closure and that sense of evenness. Next is the concrete poem. A concrete poem, also could be called a shape poem, is written in the actual shape of the subject. Now, the way the words are arranged is as important as what they mean. They have to be in the shape of the subject of the poem, or it's not a concrete or shape poem. Once again, it does not have to rhyme. So if you take a look at your rainbows poem over on the right hand side, you can see we have rain is rainbows, rainbows, rainbows. We have a topic here. I bet that's what the, the title of the poem is. And then as you go through the different colors of the lines, everything else is referring back to what we see with rain being in rainbows. Black boots and big puddles, 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 slushy streets and sh soaked trees, 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 wildflowers and wide paths, Bumblebees, bumblebees, books of color. So all of the lines we have here refer back to the topic of rain and rainbows. The narrative poem is next. Now the narrative poetry is a form of poetry which tells a story and it often makes use of voices of a narrator and characters as well. It is told in first person. Now it is a story so it can be about anyone or anything imagined or even real. It can have a rhyme scheme and meter, but it does not have to. So I have part of The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe here. It does rhyme, it does have meter, because Edgar Allan Poe, as a poet, did like his rhyme schemes and meters. You will hear the rhythm and rhyme. It doesn't have to have that, though. So what we look for in a narrative is a first-person point of view, and they should be telling us a story. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I wand pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, merely napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. Again, Poe has rhyme scheme and meter here. He did not have to use it. 
What we look for in narrative poems is they have to tell us a story and it's told in first person. We can see a lot of the I forms of pronouns in here. Uh, Poe is definitely in first person point of view as he's speaking to us. And he's setting up a bit of a setting. Once upon a midnight dreary while I pondered weak and weary over many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. We, we know where we are. We know what we're doing. So now that we have the setting and we've heard from the first person narrator, now they can get into their story. We have a conflict. Suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. And what does he do? He starts remembering Lenore. So it is a story. We see a setting. We have a character introducing themselves. We have a conflict that is starting. The next form of poetry that we'll look at is the English sonnet. Now, an English sonnet is a poem of 14 lines that is written in iambic pentameter. The English sonnet has the simplest and most flexible pattern of all sonnets, so we're going to look at that one. And it consists of three quatrains, or four lines, uh, alternating with an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme, and it has an ending couplet. So there should be 14 lines, and if you look at my Nightmares by Gert Stridum, there are 14 lines there. And you have the first 12 lines in a very flexible but very simple alternating pattern. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. And we've learned about the couplet already, so we can see the G, G at the bottom has an ending couplet. This is how the English sonnet should be produced. And then, of course, we have to look at the lines themselves. They need to be written in iambic pentameter. They have to have the stressed and unstressed syllables, and they have to have five sets of them. Well, let's look at nightmares. There's sometimes are really bad kinds of dreams, which you want to avoid to be waking. When in your ears you hear your own screams, while your body, mind, and soul is aching, these dreams return like a bomb ever ticking to the time that they come back with anxiety. As if the past, the time of war is sticking its fingers in the present life with impropriety. Night after night, as in sleep, you plunge in. Again, you are in cover behind enemy lines. You dream of escaping barely by your skin, where you were trapped by some landmines. About shooting to kill to be able to survive, about as a duty taking someone else's life. So again, you can see the A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and G, G patterns as you look at the rhymes at the end. Dreams and screams, lines one and three uh, are rhymes. Waking and aching, all these word lines, every other line rhymes until you get to the very end, the couplet where you have survived in life. Now with the iambic pentameter, you can hear the stressed and unstressed syllables and there has to be five sets of them for a total of 10 rhythmic sounds per line. There sometimes are really bad kinds of dreams, which you want to avoid to be waking. 10 different sets of syllable sounds in every single line. Kind of difficult to write, but certainly can be done. The next form that we'll look at is the elegy. The elegy is a sad poem, usually written to praise and express sorrow for somebody who has died. Now again, this could be written in rhyme and reader and in meter, or it could be in free verse. Usually we see elegies written with rhyme and meter in them. They don't have to have them. What they do have to have is they have to be a sad poem. You're expressing sorrow for somebody who has died. And usually that is a, a written for praise. You want to express your sorrow for them, but you also want to express praise for the person, the, the, the event, the, the particular cat in this particular uh, poem. You want to express sorrow for somebody who has passed on. So let's check out Elegy for a Cat by Melissa J. White. I sit down at my desk chair and look down to make sure I don't bump her, but she's not there. We watch a movie tonight and she doesn't come bugging us to sit in our laps. She's gone in that way. We buried her today. Put rocks on top of the dirt so red in the white snow. I miss her in the way that I miss a person when they're gone. There was a dialogue I had with her that I didn't have with anyone else and it wasn't verbal. It was rooted in family. It made sense in looks and heart. She knew how late I stayed up. 
She heard how I talked to myself when everyone else was out of the house. She understood my hurts. Would find me if I was crying and hiding. She made me honest and protective. I miss her in that way, too. I miss finding her sleeping in the middle of our bed, a curled ballerina, head to her toes, on top of the white down comforter. Another type of poetry that we have is didactic poetry. It's intended for instruction, such as for knowledge or to teach. A lot of times you will see rhythm and meter uh, and, and rhyme in these. It does not need it, but most times this particular poem does have meter, it does have rhyme. So here is The Cold Within by James Patrick Kinney. Six humans trapped by happenstance in dark and bitter cold, each possessed a stick of wood, or so the stories told. They're dying fire in need of logs, but the first one held hers back. For of the faces around the fire, she noticed one was black. The next one looked across the way, saw one not of his church, and could not bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of wealth he had in store, and keeping all that he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as fire passed from his sight, for he saw in his stick of wood a chance to spite the white. And the last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain, giving just to those who gave was how he played the game. Their sticks held tight in death-stilled hand was proof enough of sin. They did not die from cold without. They died. From cold within. So didactic poetry is intended for instruction. Here in this particular context, we do have people trying to build a fire together, but as you start reading each of the different stanzas, you have the different people sitting around the fire refusing to give their pieces of wood. And as you read into the lines, you start realizing why they're doing that. They're holding back their piece of wood because they do not appreciate the other human beings around them for their different types of cultures and societies, uh, ills that they see. The next one that we have is known as a parody. Sometimes it's called the twisted lyric. Now, similar to a parody, this type of poem replaces the lyrics to a song with new lyrics. Usually this is done for com comical purposes. Now, we have different types of parodies that we have when we take somebody's very famous song, such as perhaps Bruno Mars's Lazy Song, with the song about math. Maybe if you go out and see uh, the Cali Swag District's Teach Me How to Dougie, a lot of times people will then just take that and make a parody and to teach me how to study. Um, so a lot of times you will see, if you go out to YouTube, you'll see a lot of people taking the songs that are quite famous and then twisting them around, usually in an academic, but always in a comedic type of sense. So I have one here for you. So we have jingle bells here. So we have jingle bells and all, jingle all the way. A lot of people have a tendency to do a parody with jingle bells. And that's it for my, uh, for my forms of poetry, guys. Thanks so much for stopping by. If you liked what you saw, please leave a like or leave a comment. Let me know how you're thinking and if there's anything else I can do. Uh, otherwise, if you could subscribe to my channel, that would be awesome. Please check out my other videos. Thanks for stopping by.